Yep, it's geekery time again. And uh, got a bunch of questions already. Glad to hear that. I'd be uh, sort of uh, up the creek uh, without them. So uh, let me uh, start with good old Three Things Fishing, uh, who graciously contributed uh, 10 bucks to the, the geekish fund here. Much appreciated. Says the first Bible discrepancy I noticed was in the Passion narratives. Mark has two robbers who say nothing, you know, crucified on either side of Jesus. Matthew has two robbers who revile Jesus. Luke has one criminal revile Jesus while another praises him. I'd love to hear your ideas about why these three accounts are so different in this respect. You know, um, there is a a standard lame uh, fundamentalist harmonization of this. Uh, they say that, well, uh, I guess uh, both of these guys were maligning and ridiculing Jesus, uh, but then one of them started feeling sort of ashamed of himself and said, look, I, you know, uh, we're better than this. Uh, let's uh, let's not ridicule this guy. After all, he doesn't really deserve to be up here, and we do. So, you know, it's the pot calling the kettle black or whatever. Um, let me just see for sure uh, what uh, Mark has on this. Uh, I know he does mention the two, but does he say anything about the... Uh, Oh, let's see, I guess that's chapter 15 of Mark. Whoop, whoops. Come on now. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And they cruise, what did see here, huh? Mm, yeah, verse uh, 1527 of Mark, and with them they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And, uh, yeah, okay, so nothing else said about them, but in Matthew, of course, uh, they do give him a hard time. And, uh, Hello there, little fella. I got my kitty cat, uh, Merlin, here, who no doubt wants to go out, but he probably picked the wrong time to do it. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, let's see. Let's start in Matthew 27, 41. Oh, well, uh, Nah, 39, let's start there. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Uh, this cat is going to uh, shred my uh, knee if I don't let him out. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. Here we go, Merlin. I should probably ask him every time right before the show. I'm sorry about that. Mighty unprofessional. 
By the way, where did uh, Matthew get all this choice mockery? I got it from uh, what's chapter three of the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, where uh, the detractors of a righteous guy are, uh, who, who uh, he, he, they say, uh, and this guy's a living rebuke to us. He's such a goody two shoes, and and he says he's God's son. Let's see if uh, when we torment him, God intervenes on his behalf, and it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, and then he figures, well, might as well just have the. Uh, the uh, two lestai uh, robbers, actually seditionists. Let's uh, let's uh, um, uh, join in the merriment. Sadly enough, then in Luke, it's uh, ooh, chapter twenty-three. Yeah, verse thirty-nine. One of the criminals who were hanged. Uh, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of co condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingly power, or literally come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So what's going on there? Well, both Matthew and Luke felt it advisable to uh, uh, add uh, 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 the, uh, the dose of ridicule. Matthew doesn't say it. He just doesn't need to repeat it because he said, well, you heard what the... Uh, uh, the opponents of Jesus were saying that these guys said the same thing. Uh, and, and he got their lines largely from the, the book of wisdom, the wisdom of Solomon. Luke did something different. Well, obviously that's the premise of the question, but he also borrowed this from another source because when the, uh, the repentant thief, uh, says, uh, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, He's getting this from Diodorus Siculus, who has a, a story in which uh, there is a, uh, a slave who has um, royal pretensions. He says, how did I come to this? I should be on the throne. What's going on? And, um, and uh, one of the nobles who hears him say this sympathizes with him and says, I believe you. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. You, you know, when you ascend your throne. It's the same thing, right? It, it doesn't look like it now, but I, I'm with you. I think you're right. And uh, remember me when you reach the top. And uh, the whole thing is sort of based on the Joseph story, really. That's why Luke thought it appropriate, I think, uh, because um, uh, the uh, out of the two guys that are imprisoned with Joseph, one of them uh, uh, likes him and says, remember me when you're delivered from this place and you have Pharaoh's ear, and he does, right? Uh, so what's why does Luke have what he does? He's got this apologetics agenda. He He's writing with one eye toward possible Roman readers. This is why he has Pilate exonerate Jesus three times, even though he winds up uh, giving in and having him, handing him over to be crucified. And he's got Paul declared innocent uh, several times. And he changes what the centurion said at the cross from truly this was the son of God to truly this guy was innocent. So that's sort of a come down from son of God, right? Well, yeah, but what's more relevant for Luke? That a Roman is saying that Jesus, though crucified, didn't deserve it. This is a miscarriage of justice. Get it, Roman readers? Uh, what you've heard about Jesus, not true. It was a frame up. And maybe it was true. Okay. Um, and so they, they had different agendas there. Um, by the way, the idea that one of the, the, uh, the lestai, uh, the, 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 uh, 
um, so-called robbers would say, uh, I mean, not that he would give a break to Jesus, but that he would say to the other guy, hey, we're only getting what we deserve. Uh, Lestai, robbers, probably denotes seditionists, revolutionists, as in Josephus. He's always calling those guys a bunch of, you know, thugs and um, and uh, crooks and, and thieves. Well, um, is it really likely that a guy that was put to death by the Romans because he was a freedom fighter would say, well, you know, I, I can't complain. I, I deserve what's happening to me. I, I doubt it. He's just setting up the quote from uh, Diodorus Siculus there. Uh, so, yeah, it's contradictory because uh, it's fictive. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's the, uh, the this continuation of the same question, and I already did the continuation. Yvain says, Peer Gint. I know the name, but I cannot think of whom it denotes. Uh, boy, somebody will have to educate me on that one. Uh, Yuvain also says, uh, for your information, Iran is about to bomb the crap out of secular Israel. Is this the end to a five millennia old conflict? Is this the end of time and the apocalypse? Uh, no, uh, but in a sense it is, because if it's like Armageddon, it is Armageddon, right? Um, the whole paradigmatic view of scripture, that it's not actually predicting things, um, in effect, maybe an intent, but in effect, no, what it does rather is to sketch historical paradigms, situations that have happened before, uh, and may happen again. And so you are to uh, uh, know about them, remember them. So when conditions start, when the clouds start to gather, you will think, wait a minute, I'm getting deja vu. Oh yeah, this is just like that Armageddon passage, right? And not that that passage was predicting this, but this is trying to tell you the stakes this is what's going on. Uh, you better think about how to respond. Look what happened to those people. Uh, and um, so I don't know if this is supposed to be an all-out conflict uh, because, as you know, I'm sure Israel has let it be known for years that uh, if uh, if they feel they need to, they will bomb, 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 bomb Iran. And uh, it may come to that now, um, but will it be just a strike on their nuclear facilities or going to be raining bombs or, or what? I uh, don't know. Uh, let's see. <laughs> About uh, Merlin asking, insisting on getting out. Uh, just a man from the past says, cats never pick the wrong time to do anything. Only we do. Well, that I think is uh, pretty much what Merlin would say. I should have him on here to answer cat-related questions sometimes. Uh, yeah, I don't mind doing it. I just hate to make you wait. Uh, Christopher Malloy again. Uh, was the crucifixion of Jesus... And the release of Jesus Barabbas, as some manuscripts of Matthew call him, a retelling of the Yom Kippur atonement sacrifice. There's a whole book about this by John Dominic Crossan, where he says, yeah, all of that stuff figured into the, the crucifixion of Jesus narrative and previous elements of the passion narrative, the mockery by the soldiers and all that. Uh, and uh, it's so complex, I can't really get into it here, but uh, Crossan does this incredible research job of looking at uh, the Leviticus passage about the scapegoat atonement ritual uh, and various testimonia, as they're called, um, citations of scripture in the early church that uh, were used, claimed as prophetic predictions of the passion and death of Jesus. 
uh, though they're not overtly about that. Uh, and um, Crossan is not arguing that they were actually prophecies that were fulfilled. He's saying these are the raw materials for Christians composing the passion narrative. And it, it, the details of it are really striking. He goes into Midrashic uh, elaborations on the scapegoat thing and in uh, early Christian discussions of it, like in the Epistle of Barnabas. It's really eye-opening. Uh, it's uh, my favorite book of his. And... Uh, Okay, so, but, uh, yeah, basically, that's right. Hmm. Just a man from the past. Why is monasticism a practice in various religions? Oh, we already did this one, didn't we? Yeah, I remember. Or was I offline at the time? Uh, why does Islam reject monasticism, as the Quran says, but monasticism they invented, we, Allah, ordained it not for them. Uh, well, my only uh, thinking about that is that um, Islam is a worldly religion in the same sense Lutheranism was. Both of them decided that a lot of the uh, locked away holiness, convents, monasteries, uh, celibacy, all this kind of stuff was unnecessary and violated the, the earthy human instincts with which God created mankind. Uh, and uh, so um, both uh, Islam and some centuries later, Lutheranism said no. We're embracing the creation of God. Uh, and there's even a place for violence, sadly, uh, that um, is it uh, like, rather than like Origen saying that uh, we Christians cannot uh, fight in a war for Rome, even though we may be loyal citizens otherwise, because we're a priestly people, we can't get uh, blood on our hands. Uh, and uh, kind of a selective pacifism. Well, Luther and the others said, no, no, uh, I see what you're saying, but um, there is such a thing as the left hand of God, something that must be done, though ideally it is inconsistent with pure Christian ethics, but what are you going to do? Like if you don't take up arms to fight the Nazis and because of that, all the good Christians, too good to pick up a gun, uh, because of that, suppose the Nazis win. Well, congratulations, Christians, you helped them do it. Uh, and so and, and it's like a lesser evil situation, but you got to do it. It's the shadow side of God and of Christianity, but you got to do it. Uh, and I think uh, in that sense, that's why uh, Islam, like uh, Luther and Protestantism, rejected monasticism and celibacy and all of that. They No, no, no. Uh, this is a religion of the creator of the earth. So we can't pretend, uh, we can't wish we weren't part of the earth and only lived in heaven like angels. Now, don't kid yourself. Uh, let's see Mm, Welsh backgammon, how large do you think Christianity would loom today without its Constantine moment uh, when Constantine uh, declared it a, a legal religion and then Theodosius after him made it the official religion of the Roman Empire? Um, it, it might have triumphed anyway because there were various uh, aspects of it that were attractive to a lot of people even before Constantine. The courage of martyrs, for instance. Um, uh, they, uh, the the, the uh, church fathers, some of them said that they knew that non-Christians seeing Christians get martyred said, well, these people aren't kidding around. Uh, if this thing is worth dying for, maybe it's worth living for. Also, uh, the Christian uh, disapproval of abortion. Uh, they, why, why did the, and exposure of children too? Like, why did they do that? Why did they put the 
baby out at the curb with the garbage, literally. Uh, well, uh, if they had too many uh, female babies, uh, they said, look, uh, how are we going to marry all these girls off? We don't want to be stuck with them forever economically. Uh, that's more mouths to feed and we'll never uh, be able to stop. Uh, well, it's just not economically viable. That's sort of blood chilling to hear that kind of talk. But yeah, that was very common. Exposure was very common. There's a papyrus letter uh, discovered in Egypt where some businessman is riding home to his wife while he's away on a trip and uh, his wife was expecting and he's interested now. How, how's it going? And he says, if it's a girl, expose it. Incredible, but, uh, you know, um, we recognize that as barbarism, but uh, not abortion, uh, which seems to me very similar. And the early Christians were against both of them, and that meant that uh, they had more women in their ranks, more daughters, and they married them off, but there weren't enough Christian men to marry them all, so they would marry them off to non-Christians, and um, the uh, the Christian women would sort of wheedle their husbands into converting to Christianity. Didn't work all the time, uh, but uh, but it did work often, and uh, so that increased the number of them. Christianity was uh, narrow, narrow-minded, if you prefer, uh, because they said. Uh, look, all these other religions that are somewhat like ours, these mystery religions and so on, you got to pay to join them, right? Well, not us. You, you don't pay to become a Christian. Uh, and you can't be anything else at the same time because, as Rodney Stark put it so well, members of the various mystery religions had a kind of diversified portfolio of salvation. Well, one of these cults uh, must be able to get me into paradise, so I'll join as many of them as I can afford. Uh, no, come on, you, you're 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 diluting your devotion, your loyalty to it. And Christians said, "Hey, it doesn't work that way. It's Jesus or nothing. Uh, we're we're sure Jesus is is going to save you. There's the other stuff. Forget it." And people said again that that conviction that was impressive, and they said, oh, "Okay." Uh, so everybody, every time somebody became a Christian and left the various other religions they uh, had paid up to join, uh, Christianity gained one, and several other religions lost one, and uh, so forth. Also, there was the uh, the half Jewishness of Christianity. You know, of course, by now about the God fearers among the Gentiles who didn't want to get circumcised and keep kosher and the whole nine yards, but they did think Jewish ethical monotheism was superior to the uh, worship of rapist deities like Zeus and Apollo and this kind of stuff. Uh, come on, what what is this? I mean, you're not going to rise higher than your moral paragon, right? Well, if Zeus could do it. He's God. I guess it's okay for me. Well, listen, that that's that can't be right. Come on. The Stoics were just as embarrassed at, at that kind of thing, and their recourse was to allegorize the old myth. So it doesn't exactly mean that, really, and so on. Uh, but uh, that was an appealing thing. Uh, just like how in the 1970s you had this big reversal begin, that a lot of people uh, were just indifferent to and, and tired of what was then called mainstream or mainline Protestantism more uh, theologically liberal and, and socially active uh, denominations, the United Methodists, United Presbyterians, American Baptists, Episcopalians, Lutherans, and they were rapidly shrinking and still are. Uh, and, um, and why were they? Well, not only were people not going there anymore, but they were switching to evangelical, fundamentalist, and Pentecostal denominations because they offered actual spiritual experience and dogmatic belief. Uh, 
uh, you could cheerlead for that doctrine, whereas the, 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 the liberal problem was aptly summed up in a promotional ad for the United Methodist denomination a couple of years ago. It opens with a bunch of people wandering in different directions through a clearing in a forest. Like they, they didn't know where they were going. They looked kind of half awake. And it said uh, that this is the United Methodist Church. We're all seekers. And if you're a seeker, come on in. Uh, in other words, it's attractive to have no real beliefs. Uh, of course, that can never work because if you have a congregation full of seekers, you're only one stop on their journey. You, you're not going to keep them. Uh, but that's the same sort of thing as in the early Christian church. People wanted something they could really sink their teeth into. Now, that doesn't prove anybody is right or wrong, you understand. This is just psychology and sociology. And I think all of that stuff uh, was uh, in play uh, and would have continued to be so even without Constantine. I mean, even if you had more creeps like Decius and Diocletian with their persecutions, well, th that feeds right into it. Again, uh, the heroic courage of the martyrs would still have been a pretty good advertisement for the religion they died for. So I don't know that it would have been that different, really. Yeah, all right. Um I knew you'd be able to get me out of this jam. Yvain says, Pierre Ghent is the play. Oh, where your intro music is from. Okay. Yeah, I am pretty much a barbarian when it comes to uh, culture, I have to admit. Uh, Asmodeus, uh, UK1. Uh, any thoughts on the work of James Tabor. I, I do know him and respect him. However, uh, some of his work I am not con convinced of, like this idea of the Talpia tomb in Jerusalem that has uh, these bone boxes or ossuaries uh, where um, they would, uh, a common custom was to let the body of a relative uh, who had died, obviously, uh, decompose. After a year or so, they would go back and all that was left was the bones and they would place them into a stone box, kind of like a stone shoe box in shape and size and uh, and inscribe on the, uh, the stone ossuary whose bones were in there. And uh, during some, uh, I think, uh, urban renewal in Jerusalem, they stumbled onto this cave with various uh, little sh neat niches, I guess, with uh, um, ossuaries. And one of them, no, I'm sorry, the, the collection of them had um, the names, several names that are found in the Gospels associated with Jesus. One of them, the one that was really the star of the show, it said uh, uh, Jacob or James, son of Joseph, brother of Yeshua or Jesus. And they said, oh, hey, th that sounds kind of like Jesus. And the others included like Mary, Miriam. I think there were a couple of those. Um, uh, uh, Judas, Thomas, um, Simeon, and uh, and so forth, and, and a few others. And uh, Tabor said, now, look, we have a pretty good idea of the common names in Jerusalem from that period, because there's a lot of archaeological evidence. Uh, and um, we can, from that, actually figure out more or less uh, how many people would have been named this, that, and the other, because names were very commonly used for a lot of people. Just like when I was born in 1954, I and loads of other boys were named Robert, right? And so you, I walk into a room even today, hey, uh, there's Bob. Hey, did you meet Bob yet? There's Bob over there. Oh, this guy's name is Bob. Oh, I know plenty of Bobs, right? Uh, same thing. And uh, Kathleen Corley did a study like this and said it turns out that uh, over half the women 
in um, Israel in that time uh, were named either Miriam or the other versions of it, Mary, Mariam, etc., or Salome. Uh, why? Uh, well, they were aristocratic names from the Herodian house, and people liked to sort of flatter themselves by uh, taking these highfalutin names. So that kind of statistical factor made uh, Tabor say that what are the chances you would have this particular combination of names in one family in Jerusalem? Uh, it's zillions to one. This must have been the family of Jesus, the royal house of the Messiah. Uh, that doesn't really convince me, partly because it isn't exactly the same. There are some outlying names in that tomb that aren't present in the gospel. Now, of course, Jesus could have had other uh, relatives that are not named, right? But the argument has to be based on what evidence you actually do have. And in this case, it's supposed to be the exact match between these names and the, the gospel names of, of family members of Jesus. And if it doesn't quite match, by two or three extra names, I think that kind of destroys the argument. Plus, why would they be buried in Jerusalem if they lived in Nazareth? Uh, not necessarily because Jesus was particularly popular there. So I don't quite uh, buy that. Uh, his, uh, some of his work strikes me as kind of journalistic, like you have on these uh, documentaries on the History Channel. You know, if this was so, then this might have been so. And if that were so, then this might be true. Uh, like he takes very seriously the old uh, rabbinic uh, parody of the Gospels in which Jesus was not the son of Mary and, um, and the Holy Spirit, a a Parthenos birth, a virgin birth, but rather he was the son of Mary and a Roman soldier named Pandera, uh, and that that was garbled into Parthenos, because it was also spelled Panthera. It means the panther, obviously, you know, fighting man. Um, uh, so, um, and, and he, he uh, found a, uh, a statue of Roman soldier in Eastern Europe who was called uh, Pandera. I mean, we knew it was a fairly common name or nickname, but he thinks there's a decent chance that's the father of Jesus. This just seems too speculative to me. Uh, so I, um, I'm, uh, I'm hesitant. But look, I admit a lot of my theories are very speculative too, but I'm willing to say that's what they are and uh, not to insist that uh, this is definitely true. I get the feeling Jim Tabor has a bit more conviction about his theories than, than I do about some of mine that uh, admittedly uh, some would consider far-fetched. But he's certainly a a prolific uh, and dedicated scholar. And uh, I, I do know him. I'm acquainted with him. I like him and uh, we get along well. Okay. Ah, uh, same questioner as Medeas, etc. Says, I'm looking forward to Tabor's book on Mary. That may be an example of what I mean. Unless you're like a, a Catholic drawing on tradition as if it were history, what can you really know about Mary? Uh, is there a whole book in that? I don't know, but haven't read it yet, obviously. It isn't out yet. Christian Malloy says, I'm a fan of Dr. Tabor, but my guy says his theories are too tidy. Maybe that's similar. He says, my gut tells me that. Yeah, that's kind of the way I feel. But I'm not discouraging anybody from reading his work. Go ahead. He's a creative and, uh, and very intelligent scholar. Um, mm, 
Oh, yeah, I did answer this one yesterday, but maybe I was uh, blinked out. Um, Z Salone says, sorry if you answered these yesterday, but in Judges is the Benjamin story, a retelling of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, well, uh, what Benjamin story does he mean? Um, he's referring to uh, in the book of Judges when there is a near genocidal war against the tribe of Benjamin because certain Benjaminites uh, gang raped and killed this concubine of uh, I think an e Ephraimite uh, who was staying with her father after having brought her flowers and candy to make up for a spat they had. And um, and he pretty much leaves her to the mercy of this raving mob. And uh, he's a little surprised that she was so ill-used. And so he, he cuts up her corpse and FedExes the pieces to the various tribes. There's no king yet, no unified government of the tribes. Uh, and so he says, we have to act together to avenge this atrocity. Are you with me? And they all say, okay, we'll get on the war path and avenge this thing. And uh, what led to it? Well, this uh, thing where the guy uh, and his uh, concubine, sort of unofficial wife, um, they are visitors in uh, a, a foreign land, a different tribal area, and they're, they're offered shelter for the night with uh, her, her dad. Uh, and while they're uh, playing poker inside or watching football or something, uh, the uh, this mob gathers and says, oh, we don't like strangers in this town, uh, and uh, bring them out. And he just tosses the woman out to them, and uh, they do what they do to her. And uh, and it's it's just like the Sodom and Gomorrah story in terms of the plot logic, right? These two guys have sent have been sent from Yahweh. Uh, they're angels, but nobody seems to know that because they don't have wings or halos or anything. They just look like guys. Uh, and uh, Lot, Abraham's nephew, sees him and says, "Hey, you guys don't camp out in the." town square come on in i'll give you shelter and food i said okay great and uh he's got two virgin daughters as it turns out well they're having a high old time when the surly mob gathers at the door demanding that lot bring these two guys out for their inspection because as the rabbis interpreted this like there's the con the contrast set up between hospitable Abraham uh, and hospitable Lot and these SOBs who are are xenophobes and highwaymen effectively and uh, Lot uh, to throw them off the track. Hey, don't don't kill these guys. I know that's what you have in mind. Please don't do that. I I can't yield them up. I've given them hospitality. And by our code, I, I, it'd be like stabbing them in the back. I can't do that. I tell you what, if uh, you got nothing else to do tonight, I got two virgin daughters here. Why don't you take them and do whatever you want? You know, that, that's that's worse for us. But in terms of the ancient values, which we're gladly beyond, uh, a lot is to be understood as willing to make the ultimate sacrifice uh, to uh, so as not to uh, betray these people he has sheltered. Well, it's basically the same thing happens, only the result, though it is a terrible judgment on the, the men of the city, in the one case, it was a volcanic eruption of bitumen and rock salt that consumed Sodom and Gomorrah. In the other, it's a near genocidal war against that tribal area. Uh, and um, so, yeah, it looks like they are both just variants of the same story. I don't know if there's any way to tell which was the earlier one, but they're, they're exactly parallel to an amazing degree. Now, as to the um, the chopping up, the dismemberment of the woman, Saul does the same thing with a, a livestock animal. Is it an ox or something? I forget. Uh, when uh, there's a, um, a threat by the Ammonites against... Um, 
somebody in one of the Israelite territories, and there's no king yet either. This is how Saul becomes king. He hears about this and says, I'm not going to let this pass. So he takes this ox or whatever, chops it up into 12 pieces, sends them to the various tribal areas, and they say, look, we can't abandon these people. Uh, let's go fight the Ammonites. And they do. And this works very well. And uh, so they say, you know, uh, we could never have acted together unless we had this guy or uh, somebody uh, unifying us. That might not be a bad way to proceed. Let's ask Saul if he'd be willing to be king. Um, uh, but the idea in both cases was you take the dismembered corpse and send it around to say, at present, we are all separated. We should be together. And to uh, avenge the terrible wrong done to uh, uh, to somebody here, the, the woman herself or um, the... Uh, the, the what's about to happen to the uh, isolated tribe. We've got to get together. Let's do it. And they do. Uh, and uh, so very similar. And, and it's the same practice. I assume others did this kind of awful thing as well. Yuvain says, speaking of crossing, he describes two Christs, one that saves the world, the other saves your life. I find the latter more relevant and the first kind of utopian. Yeah, I'm guessing, uh, I think I've read the book you're talking about, but I, I don't think he means there actually are two Christ, but they're two Christ concepts. And uh, that traditional religion has been too myopic, uh, saying, well, I got to get my ticket to heaven. And that's what Jesus came to do. He was at the ticket booth handing out the you know, the, as, as Reverend Billy Saul Hargis used to say, most Protestants go coach. Uh, and uh, and he's, Crossan is more social reform minded. And he says, that's just selfish uh, to, um, uh, to uh, just be concerned about uh, making sure your butt doesn't fry in hell. And, uh, now you're wait. You're saying that the one who saves your life is more relevant. Uh, okay, Christ, the Savior of the world, is utopian. Huh? Oh, okay. I somehow got that mixed up, but uh, I imagine Cross and does favor the uh, the world saving version. Oh, I talked about this last night, but it must have been during the dead air space. Again, Z Stallone, who was the first to point out that the Sodom story was about hospitality, uh, not um, homosexuality? And what are good books explaining the issue? Uh, I think the answer to both is the same. It was, uh, a, a, I believe, an Episcopalian priest, Sherwin Bailey, uh, who... Um, Oh, man. I'm sort of thinking it was homo. The title of the book was Homosexuality in the Western World, but that seems too generic. But if you looked up Sherwin Bailey I, I, on Amazon, I'm sure you'd find the book is still available. He can't have written that many books. So, uh, but that's definitely uh, the, the best concise one on the matter. And I, as far as I know, he was the first to mount that argument. And he, I, uh, found it very convincing. Mm, see, Stallone again, uh, who was Micah in, in uh, Genesis? Uh, and was his Levite priest supposed to be the same as in the Benjamin War? Uh, well, uh, in this story, uh, this guy named Micah, plenty of people were named that, um, gave a position, a staff position in his house to an itinerant Levite who wasn't a Levite priest exactly, not like the ones we usually think of, but he could function as a priest because a priest was also an oracle. So he, he wasn't on duty at a temple anywhere but he could use uh, oracular devices as priests could 
to tell your fortune, predict your future, uh, find lost articles and stuff like this. And um, this this guy, Micah, is, says, hey, you're just what I need. Uh, it would be a great advantage having somebody uh, in my household with your abilities. Tell you what, I'll pay you 10 silver pieces a year and give you food and board, food and uh, board and uh and uh, that'll be great. And so he brings in his uh, collection of oracular devices. That is an ephod, the Urim and Thummim, a couple of uh, uh, statues of, of ancestors. They believe you could get them to tell you the future, the teraphim. And uh, eventually uh, some uh, scouts from the tribe of Dan who are looking for a new area uh, which happens to be close to where Micah and the, the Levite and the family live, uh, they, uh, I think they ask Micah for directions. Yeah. And, and they, they ask, they see the, the oracular devices and say, what, what's all this? And he says, Oh, I got a Levite on staff who tells the future for me. He says, not anymore. You don't. So they take him along. Wouldn't you rather work for us? There's plenty of us. He'll get a big raise. And he says, well, okay. Uh, and, uh, and, and so on and so on. Well, after that, immediately after that, we go into this story of the, the guy and his concubine who gets raped to death and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a, he is a Levite, if I'm not mistaken, but it's not the same guy. Uh, it just sort of, sort of happens that uh, both of them involve uh, uh, a Levite. And, uh, okay... Oh, yeah. And uh, why do the Israelites steal women for the Benjaminites? Uh, this proves women were property, despite what apologists say. Uh, I'm not absolutely sure. I, I guess so, because one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not covet your neighbor's lawnmower or his blender or his uh, big screen TV or his wife. Uh, that does imply that, uh, but it only implies that it's not absolutely certain, but it, it does kind of seem to indicate that she was a possession. Um, but this this part of that story is based on the, the Roman story of the rape of the Sabine women, uh, where they didn't have enough women, and so they went to this neighboring tribe and just abducted all the, uh, the women and uh, marry them. Well, something like that happens here because so mad are the other tribes against the tribe of Benjamin that they they don't know when to stop and they kill just about everybody in the tribe. And they say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, what are we doing here? We can't uh, extinguish one of the 12 tribes no matter what they did. Uh, but there's not enough women left for them to repopulate the tribe. Well, Maybe we can steal some from some other, uh, some neighboring group, and they do. Uh, and this isn't condemned, but Im implicitly it is. Because again and again in the book of Judges, you have this refrain. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And thus, it was chaos. It was the purge. Right. And uh, and so, yeah, it, it is frowned upon, but I I guess the, the uh, writer or redactor did agree with the idea that they uh, it wasn't an option to kill the whole tribe. Of course, they they shouldn't have carried it that far. But once they did, what are you going to do? Um, see, Stallone was Samson the same deity as as Hercules, both being sun gods originally. Um, or were, were they independent personifications of the sun? Because that's the pattern in uh, various ancient uh, religions. You start out with the, the natural force and you personify them and then you make uh, them into a god who has charge of that department of nature. And then you make them into a demigod who is a man among men basically, but a superhero. And that may have happened separately uh, with Hercules and Samson, but some scholars feel like they're so similar, 
it may be the same mythic hero, just given different names in uh, in in different nearby countries. And in either case, you are talking about astro theology, uh, where uh, the sun was personified. Great book on this, Ignatz Goldsier's. This uh, G O L D. Z-I-H-E-R, Ignaz, I-G-N-A-Z, I think it is, a Hungarian, a great scholar on the Old Testament and Islam. His book was um, Mythology Among the Hebrews and Its Development. I believe it's been reprinted and uh, is uh, probably still available. That is That shows you how an amazing number of Old Testament characters were originally uh, incarnations of weather, planets, stars, and so on. Fascinating. Uh, really great stuff. Oh, and... and uh, Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, another book more recently is Acharya S. or D.M. Murdoch's book, Sons of God, uh, S-U-N-S, uh, Solar Deities. And the ones she's interested in there are Jesus, Krishna, and the Buddha. Uh, it is really an encyclopedia of a book, really fascinating. And, and uh, Okay. Yeah, let's see here. See, Stallone, the book of Revelation is also supposed to take place with the flat earth dome cosmo cosmology in mind, or, or is it? Um, I, I think so, because I, as I understand it, eventually... Uh, the uh, Jews, Hebrews, whatever, went from the original cosmology of three heavens, the blue sky with the birds, the night sky with the stars, then an, an, an outer space ocean, and above that, the third heaven where God has his throne. Well, later they switched to Ptolemaic astronomy, uh, which had the earth at the center, whether it was supposed to be flat still or round, I don't happen to remember. Uh, but they believed that there were seven heavens. Each was a crystalline hemisphere. Well, I guess probably a sphere altogether because they, they moved. Uh, and in each was set one of the seven planets as, as they reckoned them, right? The moon, the sun, Mercury, Venus, um, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and they thought they all revolved around the Earth. Uh, and uh, again, there were the different archons and so forth that were on each uh, planet. And if you ascended to heaven, you had to know the passwords to get past them and so on. Um, but um, yeah, they, they do have like stars falling from heaven in, in Revelation as in the Gospels, which certainly means they believed in a flat earth with the stars being tiny objects in the sky, like inset um, ceiling lights. He says, what the heck is wormwood? That's this deadly comet hurtling toward the earth and finally colliding with it in Revelation. And the Greek uh, word uh, translated as wormwood is absinthe. Right, that which is a sort of sometimes dangerous type of potent liquor, uh, and uh, it's named for this thing in in Revelation. And I, I just um, scripted a comic book, all Gnosis Comics number one, and in one of the uh, the the title of the story is against the Antichrist, and it looks like the Book of Revelation is coming true, and these superheroes band together to stop it, and two of them, kind of Superman clones, uh, uh, decide to fly into space to destroy the the Wormwood Comet, lest it hit the Earth. So, fun stuff. Yeah. Okay. Z. Stallone, is baptism a requirement to get into heaven? If so, how did the thief on the cross get into heaven? P. 
People on their deathbed were just starting to believe people who die while in catechism. How about them? Well, as to the latter, uh, the Roman Catholic Church refers to that as baptism of desire. Circumstances may make it impossible, but uh, God knows you would be baptized if you could. It's very much like Karl Rahner, Roman Catholic, his theory of the anonymous Christian. Somebody on the other side of the earth may never have had the opportunity to hear about Jesus or the Christian gospel, but their heart is right. Uh, whatever they believe about God, uh, they're sincere. They, are, they don't trust in their own imagined righteousness. They're repentant and humble and righteous, Christian enough for God, uh, uh, Rahner said. And uh, this is kind of like that. I would guess it's the same with the thief on the cross. They're not going to send him to hell on a technicality. Uh, but, of course, there's bigger problems with that as well. Uh, Luke has inserted it because of his apologetic agenda. You see, even one of these other crucified guys stuck up for Jesus. I mean, take it from him. He says, look, you, uh, you and I... Uh, Demas and Justice, they were called. We deserve what's happened to us. We're no good crooks, but not this guy. You, you hear that, Roman reader? One of these people that deserve to be on the cross knows good and well Jesus doesn't. Get it? Get it? Uh, so he's added that, and then, of course, Jesus has to reward him. But that introduces the problem of, wait a minute, do you mean Jesus instantly went to heaven and took this guy with him? Uh, that sort of casts doubt on the idea of him being dead for a couple of days and forget about the descent into hell thing, right? There's no time for that if, if this happened. Uh, so it, it, it makes it problematic, uh, but that's why he, he put it in there. And it, it does raise various questions I don't think occurred to him. Uh, just a man from the past, or justice, as I call him. Uh, can religions be separated into those that see the world as fallen, or as its core, corrupt, or illusory? And those who uh, see the world as naturally good and ordered? How do these competing ideas blend? Well, I guess you could divide them up that way. Um, some would say that the world and humanity basically are fallen. They weren't sinful. It wasn't in the plan. Ideally, that's not part of the human profile, but in fact, everybody is sinful. Whether they inherited it from a primordial ancestor or the more of them individually became corrupt, they formed corrupt institutions, and now there's no way to avoid being tarred with the climate of, of sin. Uh, but uh, the Stoics had a bit of a different view, right? They said there is a prevailing condition for humanity that really ruins everything, and that is putting too much stock in material goods and physical pleasure um, and, and shunning and fearing and gra grousing about misfortunes. No, no, you should use the reason that Zeus gave you to, to understand that nothing but virtue matters. And whatever happens to you, whether it's winning the sweepstakes or like being like Job, either way, what you, using your God-given reason, should do is to ask, what can I learn from this? How can I use this experience to become more virtuous? Because in the long run, that's all that matters. Everything else is indifferent. It's not bad to be rich, to have possessions, but don't let your heart be there. Uh, no, that stuff, if you lose it, eh, what have you lost? It, it's virtue that matters, and nobody can steal that from you. So that's a bit different, but it's the same idea that the, the human race is in a big mess, but there's something they can do about it. Buddhism, what's the problem there? It's craving. Uh, you are seeking final satisfaction in material things and physical experiences, but as soon as you got it, it's gone. 
because everything is always in flux. So you're on a merry-go-round and you're always grabbing for the brass ring, but it will remain out of your reach and you will be reincarnated again and again and again until you finally put two and two together as Prince Siddhartha did and say, maybe my problem is I'm looking for satisfaction where it can never be found. Uh, maybe I need to uh, stop craving uh, and look within and extinguish the, the illusory ego. And then no more reincarnation, only the bliss of nirvana. So it's not quite sin, but it's analogous to it. So you've got one form or another of this in various religions. Uh, Islam, of course, uh, sin, may, mainly thought of as ingratitude. What, you are ignoring the fact that Allah has given you all these good things, including your very life? What a jerk you are. You're an ingrate. They're more likely to speak of being an ingrate than an unbeliever. Uh, okay, now, what are religions that see the world basically as good? Well, I would say paganism did, classical paganism, though they weren't fools. They understood that terrible things happened. Um, uh, let's see, um, I would say, uh, Shinto and, and analogous natural religions that are sort of, uh, mythologized, uh, nature worship and life affirmation, whether there's an afterlife or not. Joseph Campbell said this, that when he first visited Japan, it was a revelation to him because he was in a world where they did not think the world was, had fallen, that there was no curse on it. Uh, and that made a big difference. He perceived it differently because everybody else did. Right. And, uh, uh, and so th that would have been one, because again, there are victories and defeats and so on, but it's not like humanity is basically rotten. Um, mm, Hinduism certainly believes in sins and uh, paying for them uh, and, and karma dictating what's going to happen to you, but there's uh, yoga and other devotions or ways out of that. So, yeah, I guess you could say that. Probably shamanism would be considered a purely natural approach to the world and to the, the ancestors who were analogous to the gods. I doubt if they believe there's some congenital, all permeating negativity, uh, like uh, these, these uh, supposedly more advanced religions think. Yeah, let's see. It's just a man from the past, Justice again. Uh, no, yeah, he's responding to disease alone. I think it, in Revelation, I think it means the star turns to wormwood and thus bitters the water as wormwood is used to flavor various liquors, including vermouth, which is cognate with, uh, uh, wait a minute, with what? I don't know. Uh, with, uh, which it is a cognate with, yes, okay. Uh, and he also says, uh, though wormwood is also used in ancient times as medicine. Yeah, okay. And this turns all the waters of the earth bitter, right? It says in Revelation. Yeah. Um, Christopher Malloy, were the early martyrs Pauline Christians uh, or Jamesian Christians? or Gnostics. Well, James was supposedly martyred. Um, well, so were all the apostles, including Paul, according to their legendary biographies. In fact, we don't know what the heck happened to them, really. Uh, but apparently all Christians were in danger of that because I doubt if the Romans um, made any real distinction. Uh, some Gnostics, as Elaine Pagels describes them, did not uh, go for martyrdom because they figured, well, I'll say anything you want me to say. The real God knows the heart. 
you know, I, outward things, uh, you know, I'll deny or affirm anything you want, you know, give it to me, I'll sign it, uh, God knows better. Uh, but uh, we hear in Nag Hammadi that one group of Gnostics excoriated another because they didn't have many martyrs to their credit. So some of them uh, embraced martyrdom, some didn't apparently. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me see here. Uh, just, justice again. Do religions have actual influence on cultures, or are religions merely the conduits, reflections, and reifications of pre-existing cultural norms? I, um, I think both of those options are implying a kind of serial uh, cause and effect thing. I, it seems to me that um, religions are like um, Peter Berger calls them sacred canopies that arise together, if possible, uh, with the values, mores, and beliefs of the culture. Uh, religion is the glue that holds everything in position, the capstone that gives stability to the whole system of beliefs, mores, customs, values, etc. And uh, mythically, that is put in terms of a god giving these laws. Shamash gave the code to the emperor Hammurabi. Um, Yahweh gives the commandments to Moses. Apollo gives them uh, to uh, the Greeks and so on and so on. It's a way of saying this is the ultimate canopy of values that governs our life in the world. Uh, and to say they're divine means, yeah, there's nothing higher. This is the ultimate court of appeal. Uh, and to say God made them is like a, it's like ritual said about Jesus. It has the value of God for us. And, um, uh, in a way, it's priestcraft, right? Hey, buddy, you better not uh, steal that thing because uh, God said thou shalt not steal and he's going to fry your fanny in hell if you do. Uh, well, is it just a, a deceptive sanction? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, some must have viewed it that way, but I have to assume the ancients were pretty sincere about this and that they did believe these gods had given these laws and therefore uh, that's how we know they're right and ultimate. Uh, and the one big problem we have is that given religious pluralism and scientifically based philosophical doubt of religion, uh, our sacred canopy tends to be crumbling and falling uh, because not believing in the divine origin kind of turns into not believing in their ultimacy. Well, who says they're ultimate? Well, not God. Oh, come on. Um, if there is a God, he can't be bothered with such things. Well, there probably isn't. Well, then what do you do? Uh, well, um, Russell Ritchie and other scholars uh, talked about civil religion. They say when you have a pluralistic society where there are all beliefs and none, uh, people can't agree on a single divine source for anything, uh, then uh, what you do is to fall back on a second unacknowledged religion, uh, patriotism. Uh, you have all the original stuff, you just call it something else. You don't believe in an inspired scripture, or do you? Isn't that what you think the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, the Declaration are? Uh, yeah, I mean, look at the, uh, the rabbinical scrutiny given the meaning of the Constitution. It's like you know, scribes debating the implications of the text of the Torah. It's the same thing. Uh, and uh, I don't even want to say it's analogous. It's the same thing. Um, do we have holy relics? Oh, certainly not. Oh, yeah. What do you think all the, the furor over flag burning was? Uh, and people said, well, look, it's a free speech issue. It may be infuriating, but they have the right to do it. Yeah, I, I think that's true. 
But I don't like seeing it either. Why? Because the problem, the unstated problem is it's blasphemy. It's sacrilege because the, the flag is like the cross to a Christian. Uh, it is a sacred thing. It's not just a piece of cloth. Uh, and, uh, oh, so on down the line, uh, we don't have the church fathers and the apostles, but we do have the founding fathers. And their word goes. We still hear debates. Well, you know, this isn't what the founders intended. Um, and uh, we have sacred totems, the bald eagle. Uh, I'm leaving out uh, holy days, right? July 4th, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, uh, and the secular saints like Abe Lincoln, the savior who by his sacrificial death reunited the country and uh, so on and so on. Dr. King, right? Also a religious figure, but considered a saint because of the civil good he did and so on. So we don't call it a religion, uh, but uh, because if we're a Christian, a Jew, whatever, we don't want to say we practice two religions. But in a sense, that is the common religion of a pluralistic society. We're getting into bigger trouble, though, because that is crumbling. Uh, like we had these jokers out in uh, Minneapolis, was it, uh, saying uh, death to America. Yeah. Uh, great, just what we need, right? Uh, there, there's no vision in common anymore, so watch out. Um, hmm. Okay, uh, just a man from the past. I, too, view the ancients with respect, but wouldn't it be fair to say they were stupider? Little or no schooling for most. Malnutrition and the Flynn effect, which says IQs have increased over time. Oh, well, I'm just saying that the the uh, idea of the ultimacy of the laws and the sacred canopy that enshrines them and uh, gives order to a society, it was easier to have when people didn't yet ask the questions we ask that disincline us to religious faith anymore. So in a sense, yeah, they were more childlike and naive, and you could say stupider, uh, but... Um, uh, that did have an advantage or two, I guess I should say. I I'm not trying to say, oh, yeah, we ought to return to that. I think there's a great uh, advantage in pluralism. Uh, so it's just a kind of a historical irony that I'm pointing out. Okay. And Christopher Malloy, respectfully, there's more to Dr. Tabor's tomb theory than you've made it out to be. He presents a very rational explanation uh, I'm not sure I buy it entirely, but I can't dismiss it outright. Um, I'd welcome more. I, I've read the Jesus dynasty, but it was so long ago now. I don't remember. I, I, all I do remember is what I outlined before. Uh, and if there is more to it, I'd appreciate a reminder. Um, I doubt if I'm going to have time to reread that book anytime soon. But uh, um but you may well be right. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Welsh backgammon. Tabor often puts two and two together and makes five, but he also provides useful everyday snapshots of what life might have been like at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. You won't hear me dissing him. Yeah. I mean, I feel the same sort of way about Ralph Ellis. I, I don't know enough uh, and haven't looked at it deeply enough to say, but the S the uh, Edesson thing is somewhat plausible to me, but I, I don't yet know to agree with it. Uh, and yet I think uh, Ralph is, is a, uh, a genius and a scholar and I respect his work. It's the same sort of thing with Tabor. Um, you will never catch me uh, making snide remarks. Uh, I won't ever catch me making snide remarks about these gents. Okay. Um, and... Uh, hmm? 
Okay, uh, justice again. The Vulcan salute is based on the priestly blessing of the Kohen representing the letter Shin. Nimoy thought it represented the feminine aspect of God. Where would he get that idea? I don't know, maybe the Kabbalah, because that would be the Shekinah. Uh, and uh, maybe Shin is an abbreviation for that. I, I mean, he was a Jew. I am not. So I, I love and learn about Judaism as much as I can, but that I, I don't know. But I, I did know that, yeah, he took the uh, the priestly blessing symbol for the benediction and just used half of it for the Vulcan sign. Uh, that was his invention, and as was the Vulcan nerve pinch. Uh, he, he came up with that as a, kind of a good device uh, in case you didn't, weren't holding a phaser. Yeah, oh boy, I love that show. Okay. Um. <laughs> Z Stallone says, thanks for re-answering the questions. I know your time is valuable and you choose to spend it with fellow Bible geeks. Can't think of anything more fun. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is from Robert Slattery. When God created the male and the female in the Genesis text, they were created into a single image. Uh, was would this mean the original deity of God was both male and female? Well, some have said exactly that, uh, that God must have been androgynous. You might think, well, wait a minute, God is an abstraction or a spirit. Uh, not in Genesis, uh, right? Uh, man, uh, man and woman are made in the image of God. Uh, and they are man and woman. So uh, some of the ancients thought that, yeah, God has uh, has both natures or whatever. But it could possibly mean that there are gods and goddesses. And so making the humans in the divine image means making both kinds. And uh, the gods could beget and bear children. Right. So um, it might mean either one. And uh if God was an androgyne, that fits in with uh, the Adam being androgynous to begin with, and then split into Ish and Isha, or Adam and Eve. Um, so that is certainly a quite plausible uh, inference from that. Yeah, uh, Uvain uh, says, I believe Hercules is Orion, but Samson is the sun exalted in Aries. I'm probably right. I sure don't know any better. Yeah. Uh, Matt Dubinsky says, good to see you back. Another great show. Uh, thanks to great uh, listeners. Uh, Uvain Latin, the Latin name for the herb is, uh, the herb in absinthe is Artemisia. What do you know? Hmm. I'm learning something every episode. Okay, Grand Pong, in my opinion, Samson is what you get when you circumcise Hercules. Okay, could be, could be. You know, one argument that they weren't the same guy is a sort of cheesy sword and sandal movie uh, from the 70s, I guess. I'm not quite sure what the uh, title is anymore, but it's really neat. Uh, it's got Hercules meeting Samson and Odysseus, who sort of added baggage, uh, but they have a great classic superhero fight in the beginning, and then they team up against the bad guys, classic comic uh, book logic. Uh, but uh, of course, I'm kidding. That is in no way a, a factor in settling that question. Um, Mm, gay, you vain pagan means farmer, yeah, or a rustic, a hick. Uh, farmers invented astrology for timekeeping so as to know when to reap and sow and uh, harvest crops and so on, right? Also, uh, I guess uh, sailors and captains did too, right? To navigate by. Hmm. By the way, heathen means the same thing, a bumpkin from the heath in the countryside. Right. Well, no, pagan, I think. Yeah, that's what heathen meant. I think pagan just meant uh, a secular citizen, not a priest, not a member of uh, uh, any uh, official religion. Could be wrong, but... Um, 
see, uh, Uvain, uh, no, Graham says to Uvain, don't sell the hunters short. The language, quote unquote, used in the cave paintings was decoded last year, showing that the painting relayed uh, herd reproduction and behavior information. Whoa, wonder how they figured that one out. Fascinating. Uh, okay, uh, the Dusty Dud. What is the origin of Ramadan? Is it pre-Islamic? I'm thinking it might have been because they did have the pilgrimages to Mecca before Islam, and I believe that was done in Ramadan. If that's the case, then it is pre-Islamic, but I'm just inferring that. I don't know that I've ever read it. Uh, or if I have, I probably forgot it. But that would be my guess. Um, uh, the, uh, what is this now? Uh, yeah, Uvain says, yeah, I believe these systems developed over thousands of years. I'm not sure if you mean the uh, astrology and the cave painting or Ramadan. Um, uh, Justice says, sorry, I didn't mean to connect my question on the intelligence of the ancients with cultural norms. Great cogent connections, though, on law, patriotism, and religion. Hallelujah. Boy, listen to that thunder. Um, Christopher Malloy, would Jesus be a rabbi? Uh, and if so, would he have been required to be literate? I guess he would have been, but... I've, I've been reading a bunch of stuff. Well, I, I did when I was researching my book, Judaizing Jesus. And uh, often people, sometimes fundamentalists, um, will say Jesus was a rabbi and they think he went through a rabbinical school and stuff. Uh, they, they don't quite grasp what was going on back then. Uh it seems like rabbi became a title later in the first century. Uh, and it's not clear. And so some scholars say, well, uh, Jesus was called rabbi, but it must have been in an honorific sense. I uh, kind of don't think so. I think it's probably an anachronism that uh, they don't want to admit that it's anachronism, but it, it is an, it is too, it's occurring too early. You did have scribes, but that, and they probably were the precursors to the rabbis, but the, the rabbis appear to have been a later development, still within the first century, but Jesus is placed within the first third of the first century, and uh, the rabbis apparently come on the scene a bit later. Uh, but uh, Jesus is pictured as knowing his Bible pretty well and as reading from it in the synagogue, so at least he was remembered or imagined as literate. But who knoweth? Yeah, let's see. Okay. Just a man from the past that becomes really dangerous when instead of two parties arguing which side God, the law, the founders, whatever, would be on, they don't even think there is a God, at least not a common one. Yeah, right. How are you going to, you know, God in the Bible says so and so. Yeah, but in the Quran, he says this. Uh, well, our God over here in the Indus Valley said that. Uh, yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, okay. Graham Pong says, what are your thoughts on my working hypothesis that the Bible characters are essentially literary characters based upon one or more historical figures? Well, I think you're being too generous in terms of those historical figures. Like Abraham seems clearly to me to simply have been the moon god. Uh, and uh, Isaac was the son, he who sits in the heavens laughs. Uh, Samson, uh, the son is what his name means. And uh, well, Solomon was a real guy, Shalmaneser III, but he was an Assyrian emperor, not a Jewish king. Uh, and so I think there probably was no David. Uh, when you get into the later, less interesting parts of the Old Testament, uh, you start reading about real characters like Omri, uh, king of Israel in the north, who 
uh, did uh, um, start a dynasty. But uh, how about uh, Elijah and Elisha? Nope. Elijah, the hairy one, was the son. He incinerates people with fire, etc. He rises into the sky in a flaming chariot. He was Apollo, basically. Whereas his successor, Elisha, who is conspicuously said to be bald, is the smooth moon, uh, and, and so forth. So a lot of these characters... Who knows if they existed? It seems to me unlikely that uh, most of them did. Um, yeah, let's see. Oh, boy. I for Nick Ross, how much is it going to take to be able to watch the Gospel of John videos? Jeez, ah, I, this isn't really my department. Uh I'll have to get together with uh, Bishop Taylor and figure that out. I, uh, yeah, I just don't know yet. I hope this isn't a big problem, but you're right to be concerned about it. Uh, let's see, Rico, when was the crucifix introduced inside a church? Did that develop over time, say, after women were allowed to be more visible in a church setting? I don't know, but I'm guessing it was in the time of Constantine. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, he, he didn't see the cross. He saw the Cairo monogram, according to the legend. I don't know about that, uh, because the, the, uh, the fish was an earlier symbol. I'm not sure. I can't believe I don't know that. But uh, once again, you've stumped the geek. Yeah. Okay. How about... Uh, justice from the past i think the film you're thinking of is the uncreative <laughs> yeah this is it the uncreatively titled hercules samson and ulysses from 1963 okay older than i thought that's almost as old as hercules and samson yeah it's it's a fun flick that's about all you can say but there's loads of value in fun flicks in my estimation uh, are Philistines supposed to be Greek or Semitic? Where do they come from? Why the rivalry with the Jews? Are there any books about them? I'm, I'm, I know there are, but I don't, I can't think of any. I've never read one. I, I know I've seen them listed, but I can't give you a name or a title. I would say go to Amazon and just put in the keyword Philistines. I'm sure that would turn up stuff. Um. I believe the Philistines are supposed to be Greek. Uh, they're they're uh, sort of tied in with uh, Crete and Cyprus and, and so forth. And uh, they were an expansionist group. And so they latched on to the western coast of uh, Canaan and uh, wanted to take it over, which is why Israel and Judah had their hands full uh, fighting them off. Yeah, let's see. Hmm. Is he still known as the Apostle Paul, a Philistine, or a Samaritan, or both? Well, if he was the same as Simon Magus, uh, he could have been considered both because uh, Simon was from the town of originally the city state of Gitta or Gath in Hebrew, where, where uh, Goliath was from also much earlier. And so if, but uh, if I am not mistaken, I don't think I am. I believe those Philistine cities had become part of Samaria or Northern Israel uh, by the time of uh, the New Testament. I don't think there was a separate uh, Roman province of Philistia. Uh, so um, I guess if Paul was Simon, he could be considered both, though I welcome correction on that if I am wrong. Uh, Yuvain says, uh, yes, Aegean and Phoenician mariners started farms all over the place. Uh, for instance, in Lactea, a Greco-Phoenician city in Assyria that, it, that uh, exported wine to the wider Roman Empire. Aha, uh -huh. interesting. Yeah, Greco-Phoenician. Right. Uh, let's see here. 
Uh, Rika says, thank you, Dr. Price. You're more than welcome. Uh, Robert Slattery, is it possible the Ark of the Covenant was the power source for the Nile Valley that supplied electricity? <laughs> Woo! Holy mackerel. Um, is it possible the Ark of the Covenant was the power source for the Nile Valley that stopped electricity to Egypt by use of the Nile River? similar to Tesla's idea of the Niagara, of the Niagara, of, yeah, of the use of the Niagara. I doubt that. I That sounds a little too much like um, Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, for me, but I know there, there are arguments made for um, more advanced technology among the ancients than we ever thought, like uh, some decades ago, I read about a electrical storage battery found in Iraq dating from, uh, you know, millennia ago. Uh, but I think of Rene, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bloch or something like that. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, he, he points to the Ark and said, it's a transmitter. Uh, that's what Eric Von Daniken thought anyway. But, uh, I, I would remain skeptical about that, but it would be pretty neat if it were. So let me know if it turns out this is true. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, we finished right on schedule, though we don't really exactly have a schedule. Uh, we sort of finish when we finish. Um, uh, let's say, oh yeah, I wanted to tell you, I've decided that tomorrow... Uh, Friday, I am going to read a story. I hope you don't mind that. Occasionally I do when one is relevant. Uh, I want to read um, a story called The Savage Sword of Jehu. And uh, that'll be uh, at uh, noon. And then there'll be a pre recorded um, article I did uh, and uh, it, uh, for the, the evening um, show because I've got to go to somebody's birthday party. So at any rate, I uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow at noon.